ocean villas, as the Tommies would say. Yeah, I just passed the ocean, ocean villa tea rooms. I'd like to have gone in there and had a look round. It's um, got a reputation as worth a stop, but I've got quite a few miles still to do. I've still probably got another three hours riding and I want to get into a, a campsite. Right, this is a place of real interest. This is Hawthorne Ridge. The area that we see here was the front line on the 1st of July 1916. Bowman and Hamel had been in German hands since 1914 and they had made great efforts to fortify their defensive line. On the high ground they had built a prominent strong point known as the Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt which commanded views over the British below. It was the 29th division that held this area and like the rest of the front were set to attack at 7.30am. In front of the line held by the 1st Lancashire Fusiliers lay a sunken lane in the middle of no man's land. To shorten their distance of attack, they made their way unseen through a tunnel into the lane. It ran parallel to the German position and offered cover. Sometime around 6.30am, an official war cameraman by the name of Geoffrey Malins placed himself in the sunken lane and recorded the faces of men who were soon to go over the top. Shortly after, Malins made his way to the main front line to position himself opposite the Hawthorne Ridge. And then, just before 7.20, he began to turn the handle on his camera to record a massive explosion of a British mine. The Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt had been destroyed However, the Germans reacted quickly to take up new positions on the far lip of the newly formed mine crater. So at 7.30am the 86th Brigade attacked and were immediately met with a hail of bullets from the German line. And from the crater the Germans were now firing into the flanks of the advancing troops. The Lancashire Fusiliers with even less distance to cover were still cut down within yards of leaving the sunken lane. Further brigade support prolonged the attack, but by late morning it had practically collapsed. Bowman Hamel and the Hawthorne Ridge was finally captured by the 51st Highland Division on the 13th of November 1916. Much of the footage was made into a documentary film and proved to be hugely popular and from August was watched by an estimated 20 million people in the picture houses and cinemas all over Britain. I wonder just how many families watched the film and were lucky enough to catch a glimpse of a loved one, but perhaps poignantly for some it would be the last time they were to see the face of a husband, a father, a son or a brother who had never come home. Geoffrey Malins continued filming on the front, but by the end of his first year he had been wounded twice, deafened and badly shaken by explosions and gas. In June of 1918 he was medically discharged from duty. On the opening day of the Somme, the 1st Lancashire Fusiliers suffered 486 casualties, of which 174 were killed or missing. It is likely many of the men seen here fell that day. The sunken lane lies without plaque or memorial, but the faces and fears of men captured there by Malin's camera that day will forever serve to memorialise the men that never returned. Terrain very much has changed now. It's um, 
it's not as hilly as the uh, the Somme area, you know, around the Ancre and that, but uh, yeah, quite an exposed area really. But uh, I'm going, I'm making good ground. I don't know where everyone is. I don't really see anyone on the street. Nice villages though, nice part, you know, nice countryside. In March of 1917, the German army withdrew from the Somme area to a fortified position which allowed the German troops to consolidate on a shorter front line. It was extremely well protected with bunkers, machine gun posts and deep belts of barbed wire and was a much stronger place to defend. This new line was known as the Hindenburg Line. During the withdrawal, the German soldiers destroyed villages and roads and blew railways and bridges leaving nothing that could be of use to the Allies. The British moved forward to meet the new German line, and then, on the 9th of April, in support of a major French offensive to the south, launched what would be known as the Arras Offensive. Today's journey from Beaumont Hamel to the campsite was across the same ground over which the German army retreated in 1917. It was a very pleasant ride over mostly flat terrain, which took just around three hours to cycle. Before reaching the campsite at Bois Notre Dame, I stopped by at the small town of Charisi to explore a family connection to an action that took place there. So it was on the 3rd of May 1917 when my great uncle Jack Bay was here in Charisi with the 8th East Surrey Regiment of the 18th Division. They were about to play their part in continuing the Arras Offensive, which had begun with the success at Vimy Ridge three weeks prior. The 1st, 3rd and 5th Armies would combine over an 18-mile front in an action known as the Third Battle of the Scarp. The 18th Division were tasked with taking the German-held village of Charisi with four battalions. The 8th East Surreys were to take the northern end of the village and beyond with the 7th Buffs, and the Middlesex and Bedfords would take the southern end of the village. At 3.45am the attack began in complete darkness along with a supporting shrapnel barrage. Most of the Germans that were met in the advance ran away into the darkness, with some even hiding in shell holes as the troops passed over. With the first objective line taken the barrage continued on and some of the East Surreys and Buffs pushed all the way to the second objective position. Once again, many of the Germans that were encountered simply retreated. By now, it was daylight and the true picture could be seen. There were precious few British troops on the left, with the right flank completely unsupported and exposed to attack. From the HQ set up at St Michael's statue, the East Surrey's commander sent 70 men of the supporting Royal West Kent to the exposed right flank to find and link up with any men in this area. The Royal West Kents were to only encounter the enemy, who cut them down with flanking machine gun fire. Around 7.45am, the Germans were seen massing to the south of Charisi. Then soon after, they re-entered the village from the south end, storming their way along by casting forward signalling flares to their artillery to effectively create a barrage as they moved northwards through the village. Pockets of British troops of the 12th Middlesex and 7th Bedfords bravely resisted to no avail. The Germans had retaken the village. And it was at this point that they also counter-attacked from the north and east, 
and with a few exceptions men now began to retreat as best they could with the enemy close on their heels. The attack at Sharisi had completely failed and overall the third battle of the Scarp was considered nothing short of a disaster with over 6,000 men killed on the British side alone many of whom were never recovered and now appear on the Arras Memorial. So what became of Uncle Jack? Well, he survived the day and whilst we don't know exactly where he was during the attack on Cherisi with the 8th Surreys, what we do know is that he was awarded a second bar to his military medal for carrying messages through heavy shelling and machine gun fire. In addition to twice being awarded the military medal for delivering messages on the Somme and now here again at Cherisi, there was no doubt Jack was a battalion messenger or a runner as it was known. Communication was vital on the battlefield, but wireless was still primitive and telephone lines were often cut by shell fire. Specially trained dogs and carrier pigeons could be used, but the most reliable way, and often the only way, was in the form of a soldier known as a runner delivering a message by hand. Runners were usually low-ranking non-commissioned officers such as Lance Corporals who were chosen for their fitness, stamina and ability to read maps. They had to be quick and agile to navigate obstacles and have a good knowledge of their own trench systems and the land that lay beyond. John James Ernest Bagg, known as Jack, was born in Lambeth, South London on the 13th of July 1896, but when enlisting on the 7th of September 1914, he gave the year of his birth as 1895 to allow him to see active service as a 19-year-old. He joined a newly formed service battalion, the 8th East Surrey Regiment, just days after the call-up for Kitchener's new army. This photo is of a young Jack aged 13 or 14, just a few years before a yet unknown war would change everything and he would go from delivering the news in peacetime to delivering messages in wartime. So Jack had somehow survived the day carrying out the duties of a runner. But the actions at Sharisi took a terrible toll on the 8th East Surreys, who had lost 400 men killed or wounded on the 3rd of May, on what was yet another dark day for the British Army in the Arras Offensive of 1917. I'd like to say good morning, but it hasn't been a very good morning so far. <laughs> a terrible night's sleep, unfortunately. Um, I don't know why. I just, um, I think whilst I love camping, I think after a few nights it kind of gets a bit um, uncomfortable. So, um, and then the cockerel that resides here at the campsite decided to do its utmost to wake everybody up well before its time. Anyway, I'm up now. Um, today, if you can hear, it's raining. And um, I plan to go to Vimy um, to see the memorial of Vimy Ridge to the Canadians. Um, what I will see in this rain, I do not know, but we'll have a go and see what we can film and, uh, and capture for you guys to watch at your pleasure in your comfort of your own homes. Okay, so just leaving Boyer in Notre Dame where I stayed last night. Probably the most uncomfortable night's sleep I've had in a long while in the tent. But uh, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it, eh? <laughs> so I'm making my way to Vimy, but before I get there, I'm gonna see if I can grab some uh, a few groceries because I've not had a breakfast today. Possibly a nice uh, croissant and a coffee if I can find a place that's open. It's Saturday, by the way, so I should imagine there'd be no problem. Go on, girl. Ah, this will do. Let's grab a bit of food, I think. I'm 
I'm always wary of railway crossings. <laughs> right, let's go, 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 go. <laughs> Quite breezy today, which I don't mind at all. The main thing is the rain's keeping away. Lovely old church. A memorial there in the middle. A lot of the um, a lot of the towns and villages have their own memorial to the war. They don't seem to follow a standard, a standard kind of set pattern, which is quite nice. I should really stop and take a picture, but if I did that, I'd never get anywhere. <laughs> They're everywhere. I'm just approaching Vimy. This is what I've got to climb. <laughs> it's all right, isn't it? About 20 kilos of luggage on board as well. <laughs> right, just had to stop for a breather. Um, I'm part of the way up to Vimy. Um, the road look, looks like it's going to get even steeper now, so I thought a chance to sort of stop and have a quick breather and have a little bit of drink. If I just show you, I don't know if you show too long here. Look already you can see the craters, shell holes and look at that one there look, it's really huge. Here we have the reconstructed uh, trench systems look. see the face inside on the left obviously that's a little bit higher I don't know if these are the original height or what, I'm not sure I mean I'm just over six foot and uh, I couldn't look over the top here obviously to um, to make this last they've uh, made these sandbags out of concrete and of course the floor duckboards are made of concrete sections as well the observation post. I can't even get in there. The Germans must have been small boys. Okay, this is the uh, Canadian French system. Observation post. more temporary than what the Germans had, isn't it? Well, I'm here at Vimy and um, just been in the visitor centre and it's really good, really, really good. They also offer a tour of the underground um, tunnel system. So I've booked myself on and uh, hopefully I'll be allowed to film some of that. We'll see how we go. So we're going down in the, into the tunnel. This may actually have been one of the entrances because there wasn't just one or two entrances and exits. We're a smaller group today, which is nice. I don't have to project my voice as much. Again, none of the modern supports that we see here today in this room, you can still see the remnants of where you guys see these holes that are in the wall. It's very likely that's where maps would have been pinned up. Uh, you can imagine almost you know, a table in the middle of this room uh, with maps and plans as the Italian sorts of churches, which is 
just on at that panel you see every soldier had their own map so that they knew where to go and the, on the off chance or not on the off chance in the case that uh, their commanding officer their uh, was injured uh, I met a lad who was also doing the tour, uh, similar to what I'm doing, I guess. But he's doing it in reverse. So he's come down from he's come down from Ypres and uh, and he's making his way to the Somme area tonight, I believe. So uh, if you're watching this, uh, Adam, hope you have a great trip, mate, and uh, you get to find all your relatives there. Well, let's check this memorial out now. Unfortunately, there's no drone flying, so you've got to respect the uh, the Canadians' wishes on that. You know, school trip alert. So there you have it, the Vibby Memorial. Absolutely amazing. As memorials go, I've got to say, it's probably the most stunning that I've seen so far. Um, Canada have really done themselves proud with this one. And it's a fantastic place to visit, not just the memorial, but the, the visitor centre itself, the trench systems, um, the tunnel systems, if you fancy going down one of those, which I, I might add that they're expertly led by the student guides that come here. They really know their stuff and uh, fair play to them. And all this is done for free. They don't charge you a penny for coming along to this. Um, so yeah, if you're in the area, you like First World War or you like Canada, come along, give it a, give it a visit. I hope you've enjoyed the video, please feel free to check out part 5 as I carry on my journey.